All right, cool. So uh, first, I wanted first I just want to give you guys a little bit of a. Um, uh, we'll talk about the site in a second, but just just the purpose of this intro discussion is for our next couple modules. So we've talked about coastal flooding. Excuse me, we talked about flooding in general. Excuse me. Now we're moving on to um, another variant of flooding, which is coastal flooding. And then uh, after that, we'll be talking about hurricanes. So this is a perfect place to talk about that, to set us up to do to the introduction to that. Um, and so um, I'm going to put this down here so I can actually have my hands free. And I want to make sure that everything you guys can still see me OK and everything. Let's try maybe like that. How about that? Can you guys see me OK there? Yes. OK, cool. So. Um, so let's talk about uh, the context of coastal flooding. Coastal flooding is, um, you know, can all be lumped under this idea of, of uh, the fl a flooding risk or flooding disaster or flooding hazard. Um, but I think it's important to distinguish uh, traditional quote unquote flooding or riverine flooding or inland flooding from coastal flooding. And so um, as you've already, as we've already discussed, the, the typical flooding is when we have a bunch of rain and that rain's coming down from the sky and doesn't know where to go and it essentially fills up the low areas and, and spreads out. That also plays into coastal flooding, but the other issue we have with coastal flooding is we have the, the rise of the large local water body. And so what we're talking about here is the ocean. So sea level rise, et cetera, development pressures on the coast, et cetera, um, really do create a, 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 a bit of a, a different categorization of flooding that happens in the context of coastal flooding. Now, all of our coastal ecosystems have evolved for millennia, billions of years. Uh, those ecosystems that are on the edge of water bodies, on the edge of the of a sea, um, they've evolved to deal with. Sometimes the water goes up, sometimes the water goes down. Our whole coastline in California and indeed the whole coastline around the world has been shaped by the, the changing up downness of, of the ocean. And so therefore some areas get dry for a while, some areas get wet for a while, some areas get uh, temporarily wet for a while. And in, case, in the case of um, tidal inundation, that's daily. Our part of the world, we have two uh, high tides and two low tides in most days. Uh, and so that's, so that's you know twice a day or, or four times a day, potentially you're getting changed um, inundation to areas that are near that daily inundation, but a little bit farther, a little bit higher up. And so that place would get wet only maybe seasonally or during a storm. And then we have other places that are more terrestrial that really only get flooded in um, a, a, a truly quote unquote unusual event or non-normal event. And that would be the issue we're talking about here of coastal flooding. And so uh, because these systems have evolved with flooding, the creatures here, the critters here, the infrastructure is adapted to deal with that. And there's all kinds of adaptations. So to start with, these systems are very historically robust. They're great. When, this, when the sea goes up, they just move inland a bit. When the sea, you know, sea level falls, they just you know, go lower in elevation more bit. So let's take a quick look at a few examples of that. So right here where I'm recording this, um, I, I put my um, camera on this downed bald cypress tree. So this guy has fallen over. Um, cypress are related to redwoods. Let me see if I can find an example here. Let's, let's go walk over here for a second. So redwoods um, are, uh, you know, big, tall trees. We have two species in California, including the tallest uh, 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 plant in the world. Um, we have uh, uh, these really cool trees that are very old. Their leaves are more needle-like. They almost look like bird feathers. And the way the redwoods deal with living next to a river or in a rainforest is their, their roots go like this. They're good. They go super spread out. And so right here, this is a cypress tree, bald cypress tree right here. So you can see this guy. This is this dude right here. Uh, he has sort of this great red bark, very resistant to inundation. If I look up here, um, we've, we had Hurricane Ida that struck in the summertime. And so a lot of, the, a lot of the, the leaves in the canopy here are a bit thinner than we would normally expect. But, um, but this, so this tree might be a little hard to tell in the video. So this, this tree, the diameter at breast height here, sort of the, the height at my chest, is a little bit less than a meter in terms of diameter. And if we talk about how tall this guy is, this guy's probably about 20, 
24 meters, something like that high. Um, but let's have a look. Let's have a look at the at the base of uh, uh, these 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 cypress trees, right? They have this very kind of spreading um, root. But then if we start to walk around, this might be a little bit hard to see. So you guys tell me if you can see this. Um, we have these things that are popping up here. This guy right here. It looks like a piece of wood. And I'm walking through this water. And then here's, here's another one. And there's another one and another one, another one. Those are called cypress knees. And if we look across this, if I do a pan, you can see um, all these little uh, like woody knots. And, and they're called a knee because they, they're supposed to look like, you know, kind of like if I had my knee here kind of poking up, it would be right there. So these knees are a key part. So these knees indicate roots that are coming out from this tree. And uh, if you look right here, you guys can see this. So I'm just, so uh, woody ground or, or just you know, dry ground over there, take a step right here and it's super wet, super wet, super wet, super wet, super wet. So um, these cypress trees, these, these knees, all of this is an, is an adaptation to very wet landscapes, to very um, moist, lots of water all over the place and all the time. So these cypress trees have these very broad um, root networks to keep them, keep, you know, a giant tree. And, and this tree right here, this, this, you know, a little bit meter or so diameter tree here, this is a relatively young tree. This tree is probably on the order of about, mm, I don't know, uh, 30, 40, 50 years old, something like that, maybe a hundred years old, something like that. Um, uh, but we have trees that we've corded on our, our long-term monitoring sites that are at least from the 1700s, and some are even older. And those are, you know, much larger. So they don't get as old as um, the cypress trees, but they definitely are very long-lived members of the community. To live in that system, for that, to live in that coastal system that's possibly exposed to coastal flooding, very challenging for a year, for two, for three. And we start to get to decades, start to get to centuries it's that much harder. And so these adaptations are key. So, so the roots are very broad. So, that, so um, uh, they don't go down deep like a carrot. They don't sort of go down really deep. They anchor themselves by having a webbing, a really broad webbing, a flat, um, um, a spreading root system. Because water is, because coastal flooding is so common in these regions. And I should say, I'm in a bot, what we know is a bottomland hardwood forest swamp. So this is a wooded forest, a bottomland hardwood forest. It's a wetland, just like our coastal salt marshes and other things are, are, is, are wetlands. They have, um, the soil is dry some time of year, wet some time of year. We have a, a legal definition for what makes something a wetland, which is what the Army Corps of Engineers which says it has at least 14 days of standing water um, in most years. Um, but these areas can be a lot more inundated. Um, so if you're a root system that's, that's really spread out, that can be hard. You're underwater and all the other things that happen when you're underwater, you have a hard time breathing. So do the trees have a hard time breathing. So these, these cypress knees are one response to that. So these cypress knees help keep the tree stable, but they also help um, with some, some air spaces to help the physiology of the tree do stuff as if it's, in, if, as if it's not underwater. So these cypress trees can be inundated. And by inundated, I mean the water could be up to, you know, up to, you know, say here for potentially months on end, not in this specific site we're at, but, but, but awesome adaptation. So these systems have evolved with, with flooding. These systems have evolved with um, water stress. But what's going on here in Louisiana and much of the rest of uh, the world, actually, is we're screwing with um, the systems and making them more vulnerable to flooding. So right here, let me see if I can find an example of this. Okay, so right here, this is a relatively healthy piece of forest. Um, but if we go over to, well, I guess we'll go over here. So if we go over and look at this guy. So first, of all, let's have a look. I'm, I'm just going to pan the camera straight up. I'm not going to tilt it. And if we look up, you guys see this tree's leaning? Do you guys see that? Sorry, I can't see the screen. You guys, yay, nay? Yeah, we see that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so, this, so this tree should be like about, like the one behind it. This, that, that tree should be kind of boop, more or less straight up and down. It's not, it's leaning. So that's telling me this, this tree's a little stressed. Now, trees have fallen down for 
forever. So, you know, a tree falling over in and of itself isn't necessarily an indication of a problem. But in this case, this forest is really, really hurting. So let's have a look at these, these roots right here. So if you can see right here, um, again, I'm pointing the camera, so it's a little hard for me to, I can't see the screen, but, but you guys can see a, a light gap underneath that, that root, after, underneath the, 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 the buttress there. Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. So that tells me something is weird here. So probably when this tree was born, this tree was born and started to grow and the soil was pro probably more like about right here, right? So the soil is about the height of my hand. Now it's, it's about um, here, it looks like it'd be about a foot or so lower. Um, what's going on there is this notion of subsidence. And so that means the, sorry, hold on a sec. <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> excuse me, dusty down there. So what's going dusty. on here, thank you, thank you. So what's going on here is um, the soil surface is here, normal routine, thank, thanks, <laughs> thanks you guys. The normal routine goings on of this coastal system, which is a wetland system, is to have additional sediment deposited all the time. This subsidence, this lowering of the elevation of the soil surface, um, part of that's a natural thing, just, just that always happens in these systems. Um, and if we have a look at this, uh, I'm looking right now, we're looking down at, at, at twigs, okay, broken branches. I'm looking down at leaf, leaf, ma leaf masses, right? So all this stuff is falling down. This will become incorporated into the soil. Historically, seasonally, usually springtime, the river floods, Mississippi River floods, Mississippi River, you can't see it, but the Mississippi River is about a half mile right over there. So we're very close to this big river that drains about 40% of the continental United States. That sediment comes out of the bank or jumps, so jumps over the bank and then spreads out. Those floodwaters spread out, carrying all this sediment rich material and then drops it here. So routinely we're augmenting the, the sediment um, naturally. And so this, so we have all this material in the soil, the, these leaves, and when it gets really wet and, and uh, uh, you know, not a lot of oxygen around, it goes anoxic, takes a long time, but that those, that stuff eventually, this, this leaf turns into ultimately carbon dioxide and is emitted to the atmosphere. Um, and then when that happens, the twig that was in the, that filling up that gap of the soil goes away. So now that soil can squish together a little bit more. So that's a natural process. As we cut off water from this coastal system, that's gonna happen much faster. So rather than having slowly in an anaerobic breakdown type of context, it's gonna happen much faster in a more regular soil or more aer aerobic, oxygen rich environment, and that'll happen very fast. So that's gonna speed up the rate of the squishing of the soil. One, two, um, we're not bringing in more of that sediment that, that historically in most places there's some, there's a pretty close to equilibrium balance. So the rate at which stuff is degrading and, and decaying and disappearing from the oil, uh, soil and taking out of that volume is being added to by the stuff that's being brought in um, uh, seasonally or, or with rain years, flooding uh, cycles. We don't have that. So ironically, because we've cut off flooding from this coastal system, we're making it more vulnerable to catastrophic flooding, to disastrous level flooding. And so, so one aspect is just what we just talked about. We have the, um, we have the soil surface lowering and then other things are going on. Um, I, I just posted a, a video, uh, I'll, I'll share the link after this, um, uh, that just we're, as we're driving in, another new development was going in right now. This, this, is, this, this parcel that we're at is part of an NGO we've been working with for several years to, to help them with their coastal management and, and, and wetland restoration. That's one of the things we do here when we bring students here uh, in each, each spring. Um, and, uh, and through our efforts and, and the efforts of so many people, we've actually been able to secure these parcels now. So we so our NGO partner actually owns this property and we're able to do uh, restoration and management and things of that nature. But right outside that property, you know, that we don't own, people are continuing to, to destroy and damage and, and cause problems. So that means that um, uh, it's those areas are the region overall is more vulnerable to coastal flooding. So if I have a look right here, I'm walking. This is this is a, a, a natural system. This is uh, called lizard tail, this, this plant right here. So we look, we see some uh, 
degrading logs, breaking down logs. There's a red maple tree right here. This, this is another uh, native tree. And then I turn right here and all of a sudden we see a, a little bit of water, right? So this landscape is, so it, it hasn't rained in a few days. It's been relatively dry, but nevertheless, just walk, taking a couple of random steps through the forest, we have this area, I put my boot in here. That's about, you know, two inches or so of wa deep water right there. So this landscape is a very moist landscape. So even when we're not quote unquote flooding, this coastal system has a lot of water in it. It's already, it's already really inundated. It's already really waterlogged, we could say. Um, so, uh, so now we have those, the, the folks uh, cutting down, uh, 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 putting in new developments. And so that means cutting down the forest. Again, I'll do a quick pan here so you can see the forest. All of these coastal bottomland hardwood forests here in Louisiana are stressed out. They're all, they're all hurting. Uh, our system and, and others are all hurting. Having said that, this is a relatively healthy site. Um, and so uh, stress out from hurricanes, all these other things. So as we, we Swiss cheese these coastal ecosystems, we're making the area more regionally vulnerable to coastal flooding from hurricanes, from, from sea level rise, all this stuff together. And so we're actually making the risk much greater to folks relative to having healthy intact forested systems, wet, woody wetland systems around the cities, around the developments, around the towns, et cetera. So very real issue. Um, as people, uh, we see this with our forests with wildfires as well, right? Which is people love this forest. People love walking through, hearing the birds chirp and, and seeing all the cool insects and spiders and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and so they want to come here. But the first thing they, they do is they come, move to the forest, move to the, the system, and then cut everything down right so you cut everything down so if one person put one house in not a big deal if two people put a house in not a big deal if 100 people put a house in probably not a big deal um however if you know thousands of people move in and change the system then we really start to go from little teeny pinpricks of stress to more consistent regional stressors and a lot of our flood risk or exposure is coming from this aggregate issue so in the case of so in the case of many of our coastal systems, we're having more subsidence because of the stuff we talked about. We've levied, in this case, we've levied the Mississippi and we've cut off that annual nourishment, that annual adding to the soil of sediment from elsewhere. So we've changed the dynamic process. In the case of our uh, uh, wildfire discussions, um, right? We, we suppressed the amount of just sort of background natural fires and allowed fuels to build up. Same idea. We've we've changed the, the the a lot of the ecological functioning of the system, and then we've come in as as humans and done active active clearing of these these elements. In the case of of this bottomland hardwood forest, this coastal wetland system, this is going to protect the areas farther inland. So the coastal flooding would have been restricted to a much more if if we had to say a big storm that comes up next week. Um, the people that are right on the water's edge, they're going to maybe get exposed to flood risk, et cetera. Um, but the people that are a few miles inland, not so much. Maybe they got rain or something, but they probably wouldn't have gotten flooded. And as, as we look across this system, this, this huge amount of just stuff, right? Trees, leaves, trunks, uh, uh, branches, downed logs, um, all kinds of stuff. And so the wind is blowing right now. Let's listen to the wind for a second. So that wind is really cool. It sounds, uh, could, you, could you guys hear that, hear that in the recording? Could you guys hear this wind? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, my, my multimedia skills are so fantastic. You guys are welcome. You're, you're welcome. What, what, a, what a great instructor I am. Um, uh, but that wind that's starting to pick up right now, it causes us issues when we fly our drones to try to map these systems. But that wind, what you're hearing is you're hearing that that, that wind interacts with the leaves. That whoosh, the whoosh that we're hearing is actually causing drag, reducing those that wind speed. And so therefore, those towns and, and other folks that are that are inland from us, they're not the wind isn't going to be as strong. Same thing with the water. And when water comes in in a in a 
coastal flooding event, that water is going to raise up. But all of this stuff, all of these trunks, even like this, this dead cypress guy here, uh, this, what is this, this uh, uh, red maple, um, all these different trees um, are going to act as a physical slower downer, a speed bump, if you will, to reduce that water pressure. And it's going to mean the coastal flooding is going to go less far inland. Because of our messing with the functioning of these systems, one, because of our adding in more humans and putting more material infrastructure in harm's way, in floodplains, in, on beaches, uh, in former wetlands, that kind of stuff, then, you know, we're, we're already, if we'd had those houses, even just in a regular, um, you know, a regular wetland, it would be a flood risk. But now that we're having all these other problems, it's even crazier elevated risk. All of this translates into much greater exposure and much greater likelihood of, uh, of flooding events along the coastal uh, strip. Um, and then when we add on sea level rise to that, so climate change, so oh, there's always a little bit of sea level rise, but the, the new additional uh, increasing rate of sea level rise, anthropogenic sea level rise is changing the equation. So in some cases we have just processes that are always going on and we made them a little bit worse. In other cases, we have ourselves moving into areas of massively increased hazard and massively increased um, uh, potential danger. And so, so right here, we're talking about this in the context of Southern Louisiana coastal zones, Southern Louisiana coastal flooding, but the same basic idea applies to systems in California, systems in Hawaii, systems in China, uh, you know, you, you name it. So this this is a global challenge, this increased um, exposure due to um, a, a, a changed systems and humans more and more wanting to be in the coastal zone. So when we talk about flooding, we usually think about precipitation rain events, and that, can, that absolutely is associated with flooding. But this coastal thing is a bit, is a bit um, more complicated still. Does that make sense? Anybody have a, any intro questions about coastal flooding and that general idea or general concept or what have you yeah i had a, a question professor sure max yeah um i'm pretty sure when people there's a committee that has to like make a, the go on this project when they do this how do they outweigh the benefits of like getting rid of this important system for and then providing like homes you know like how do they weigh that awesome question in the context of our wildfires so the answer to that in the context of wildfires, it's usually, um, it's usually, oh, I just caused some wetland loss. I broke a piece of wood off. Um, uh, we, um, most of that is happening on public lands. So, um, you know, national forests, state parks, things of that nature. In the context of most of our wetland systems, it's mostly happening in, on private lands. So you can't, you can't tell, but where I'm standing right now is the city of New Orleans. So this is Orleans Parish. We don't have counties here, we have parishes. But, um, but uh, so, so this, this is New Orleans. So if I got in a car and drove, uh, let's see, probably about 12, 15 minutes, I'd be in the French Quarter. Um, so we're very close to a big uh, urban center. Um, this is not public land. This is private land. So, so these are just like everything else. Somebody, somebody owns a hillside in Thousand Oaks or a, a, a plot of land in, in Oxnard or whatever, same thing. So people can do whatever they want, essentially, with, um, with the land here. And that's how we see much of the world. In places, in, so, in, so, in some areas, we have stronger environmental protections, stronger environmental laws. Now, technically speaking, where we are right here is in a wetland. And so maybe you guys have taken Dr. Reinemann's class on, on law and policy. Um, uh, the Clean Water Act, federal law, which applies to all land in the in the US, um, we're not allowed, the, the, we only have two systems, two systems in the US that are legal ecosystems that are legally protected. Um, one is wetlands. Anybody wanna guess what the other one is? National parks. Oh no, good, no, yeah, good question. Uh, good guess, national parks are protected, but I mean, I mean an, an ecosystem itself, everywhere the ecosystem exists has legal protection. So one are wetlands. It's not old growth forests, is it? No, there are particular old growth forests that, again, we've, we've tried to protect, but just because something by definition is an old growth forest, it doesn't necessarily have legal protections. It's a hard one. 
in in the the desert southwest in in California, we have uh, these areas called um, uh, de- uh, 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 watering holes or ponds or isolated ponds. So in those we have things this rare fish called a pup fish. In these very isolated, um, you think of them like an oasis ponds that that are deep deep ponds that connect to the um, aquifer. Those have legal protection. So you can't just go in and put a house on one of those um, uh, uh, desert pools. Um, so they have protections, and then wetlands have protections. Everything else does not. It might, it might, an individual parcel might have be protected because it is a national park, or an individual parcel might have protections because it is, um, you know, is in a particular location. But, but right, we most of our areas, most of our ecosystems are not protected as ecosystems. There might be an endangered species there, which causes them to be protected under the under the ESA. But. But, but with wetlands, we do have this legal protection. And, and specifically, it's Section 404C of the, of the Federal Clean Water Act. And it essentially says that if we do anything to a wetland, if we fill it, if we degrade it, if, you know, whatever, we have to um, make, we, 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 one, we can't do that. And if we do do that, say by accident, a car crashes or something of that nature, or if we're going to expand Pacific Coast Highway and it's going to impact one of these um, systems, and so like we know we're going to have the impact. Either way, we have to then make more. So if we destroyed an acre of wetland, we have to make an acre of wetland. You can take our restoration ecology class if you want more details. But what we've learned in the last two decades is we don't know how to fix wetlands exactly. So we usually say if you destroy one acre, we can only make it about fifty percent as good as the previous. So you have to make two acres so that you so that you get sort of equivalent level the same same amount of functioning that, that's the basic idea but so wetlands are protected having said that those guys are bulldozing bulldozing wetlands over there how is that legal it's louisiana is the short answer so the answer is nobody enforces those things so so um we when we do have these environmental protections social justice protections whatever if we don't enforce those issues it it doesn't matter what what nice sounding laws or, or highfalutin preambles we have to our bills or something. It's 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 not going to work. Um, just if we go down about how far would that be? If we go down about th- yeah about thirty miles south of us here, towards the the Bird's Foot Delta of the Mississippi, where we also take our class and we also do work. Um, right across uh, from so we've been trying to get the powers that be to, to um, so you all have paid for a massive, a massive restoration project there to suck. So this is an area where we have the Mississippi River, which is levied. And then we have the natural wetlands just off the side eroding and, and disappearing because of that, that cut off of sediment um, nourishment. One project that we have is we have this big giant thing that sucks muddy water when it's, when it's the, the springtime melt, when there's a lot of sediment in the water, sucks muddy water over the levee and then under the freeway which goes there and then dumps it out over in um uh in, in, into the, the ocean side the wetlands to augment them uh uh you all paid for this so this is u.s taxpayers army corps of engineers designed this thing put it in but the folks that maintain the the uh the pumps are locals and so they're, they're paid by the parish. So they're paid by the, the local government. Um, I, I can go into the politics more if you guys want, but I should probably be careful because I'm, I'm stray, straying way far from the original question. Um, but we've been trying to get those areas restored Wouldn't, for years. It hasn't happened. When reporters come down to do a story, they'll flick the pumps on and say they're pumping. When they leave, when nobody's looking, they turn them off and they, they just leave the pumps off. Um, and, uh, and that's because it impacts some of some politicians, some wealthy connected folks, um, uh, oyster, oyster leases offshore. And so the fresh water kind of messes with the oysters. They don't like it. So they want to keep them off. Um, just after Hurricane Ida came through this summer, which was a big summer of 2021, big, huge, big, huge impact um, across the region. Magically, uh, a bunch of folks showed up, started filling in the wetlands not for wetland restoration, to build a liquefied natural gas export terminal. So we could pump gas from the US and then send it overseas. Um, makes no sense. Makes no sense to have that sort of 
fossil fuel intensive economy encouraged, it makes no sense that we couldn't get this area restored and reduce the risk of coastal flooding um, when it's a, it's a good benefit thing and it's all that. But then when, when a oil and gas industry wants to do something, it's all of a sudden everything can happen. Nobody can explain to me. I've been asking people all the trip, how is this legal? How is this happening? Nobody can explain it. They're cutting down old growth forest, all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, can you guys still hear me? My, somebody just called me on my phone. Is, did, it, did that interrupt or can you guys still hear me? I can still hear. Okay, okay. So, um, so yeah, so basically um, we have private land that's being chopped down. That's private land. You can kind of do what you want as long as you don't mess with the wetlands, but they are messing with the wetlands. No penalty. We have other areas that are already degraded that we have systems in place that we can restore, can essentially pull the trigger and start restoring this area, fill in sediment, counteract this, the, the soil loss um, that won't, won't, won't happen. But then when, when some big, and th this project is multi-billions of dollars of investment to be, to be clear. Um, when we drove by, there were probably 300 pickup trucks in the lot and you know several hundred backhoes and things i mean it's it's a major major operation it's going to take them three four years to build this big giant site which is going to be something on the order of 30 miles by 30 miles in size that's not for coastal flooding but it's just a coastal installation in harm's way we're you know, in addition to all that stuff i've just talked about now we're, we're adding infrastructure that's going to be vulnerable to hurricanes add infrastructure that's going to be vulnerable to sea level rise all that kind of stuff so so these things don't make a whole lot of sense. I wish I had some better explanations for you guys, but but um, the point is we are continuing in many places around the world to increase our vulnerability to coastal flooding, not not um, sort of go the other way necessarily. Does that answer your question? That was a long that was a long answer. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. And in and, and the in us in California, if we had a wetland and somebody went to put a house on it, it it would it would uh, someone would for, file an injunction that would it would be stopped if anybody could see it um not not in this part of the world not in this not in this part of the u.s other questions they may have other other general coastal um coastal flooding questions or prelim i know you guys haven't watched all my lectures yet or or done the readings yet but but any other sort of big picture questions you're wondering about coastal inundation coastal flooding Okay. All right, cool. Um, any questions about this, this bottomland hardwood forest, this, this southern swamp I'm in right now? Before we, before we wrap. What's the, what's the name of the area? Oh, sorry. I guess I didn't say that. So, so, we're, so the, the, the jurisdictional region is Orleans Parish. We are in a region called English Turn. So if you guys search English Turn, uh, uh, Louisiana, um, so, uh, if, if, uh, Mississippi, New Orleans, the city of New Orleans is over there. The Mississippi river is coming from the North and it goes like this and it wraps, it does a big oxbow kind of thing. And so it wraps around there and then it goes this way. Then it has a big bend it has a big, so right around here it bends. So basically the river, if I point the river, it's there and 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 it's there. Again, there's a big levee between us and that area, but this is called English turn because it's a really strong turn in the river. And it's where um, essentially uh, uh, when back in the days when colonial powers were fighting over this territory, um, uh, you know, and people had their, their way of moving around the area was by sail, sailboats. Um, you know, moving down the river is easy. Anybody can go down the river in a canoe or whatever. And the Mississippi hauls. I mean, it's a really big river. Um, it's, it's massive. And, and very deep and very fast flowing. So it's easy to go down. Coming up is harder. So the traditional way was you know, use a sailboat for, for the colonial powers, a sailboat, and you kind of you know, sort of tack back and forth. Um, but that's hard. And it's really hard when, when the river turns a direction. So um, in a big battle, these guys cut down. So, so as this invading force was coming up from the mouth of the, the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, these guys were, were trying to hold their, their fort, essentially, their, their installation here in, in New Orleans. They were like, we're screwed. If these big boats come in and attack us, we're, we're gone. So what they did was, and they had only a few cannon or something. I don't remember all the, the specific details. But so they went in the forest and they cut down a bunch of uh, big trees, kind of like that one that's down there, about that sort of diameter. So, you know, you know yay big, you know, kind of 
two foot diameter or so trees. They cut them down, they painted them black, and they went to the, the start of this bend and they put them in the trees and they made them look like cannons pointing out. So when the invading forces came up the river, um, they, they thought there was all these cannon that were about to blow them. So they, they gave up and they went away. So this area is known as English Turn ever since that time. So this is an area that is historically forested. It's again, cut off from the seasonal flooding by, by uh, uh, the levees, but we're, we're essentially just on the border of, again, we don't have counties here, we have parishes, the Orleans Parish and Plaquemines Parish. And so one of our parcels is right here in, 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 in Orleans Parish. The other one is a, a mile or so that way, which is actually in the other parish, in the other uh, jurisdiction. And, uh, and, and a quick one on that, um, uh, if we had not been working here, if CSUCI had not been coming here, been lending our hand, helping with monitoring and, and, and all that kind of stuff. About In about 2015, the parish there said this other forest, which is much, a much larger parcel than this that we've been uh, monitoring since 2007, uh, post-Hurricane post Katrina. Uh, some guys decided, you know what would be great here is if we just bulldoze all these trees down in this you know many hundreds of acres parcel. Uh, and um, we put in a baseball diamond and we can have little league kids come here and play. Um, and so uh, that took, you know, all these years, we just closed, we just now own that property as of uh, January of um, 2022. So we just took acquisition of that. Um, and so, so these areas, which are essentially just south of the city of New Orleans, um, we are the buffer. It used to be here uh, or, or from, from basically, yeah, essentially roughly where we are, where the city of New Orleans is, to open water in the Gulf of Mexico. It used to be about 60 miles of wooded wetland and, and herbaceous um, um, marsh, salt marsh. It used to be about 60-ish miles before you got to real open water. Now it's about 14 miles. So there's been a massive Swiss cheesing and eroding and loss of wetlands. Um, we in California have the greatest proportion of wetlands lost. So we've lost 91% of our wetlands over the last 150 odd years. So the greatest rate of, greatest proportion, I should say, of loss. Louisiana, where I'm standing right now, is the greatest absolute quantity of loss of wetlands. And um, the last big estimate that's just being updated, but the last big estimate was about a football field every 45 minutes disappear, essentially permanently. Um, and, and it's going up, it's going up. It's going up with the increased pressure of coastal flooding, going up with a hurricane intensity frequency changes and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so the story here uh, of, of Louisiana is very much so, um, there's a lot of parallels with California. There's also differences, but, but all of us are increasingly vulnerable to this coastal flooding, um, be it driven by hurricanes, be it driven by sea level rise, what have you. And, and there are no easy answers. So when I, I didn't mean to say earlier when I made the comment about about, oh, you know, here they don't enforce stuff. We have massive problems as well. Just look at um, all of our coastal cities, Malibu, Dana Point, you, you name it, that are built right on the shore. They don't, they're not really dealing with coastal flooding either, right? So they're, they're not, they're, they're trying to armor their beaches and they're trying to fight. Um, this coastal flooding is gonna win, right? Nature always bats last. And so, so we need different approaches. And even though I, I sort of implied that uh, there's not as much enforcement here. There's not as much proactiveness in California as you might expect. There are certain areas, a great fantastic example of dealing with, with coastal flood risk. Um, and the one that people cite all around the nation is uh, Surfers Point in, Ventura, in the you know, city of Ventura by the, by the fairgrounds there, um, uh, dealing with um, coastal erosion and, and flood risk. We moved the trail, we moved the path inland and, and reduced the flood risk and made things better. Um, uh, and so there are bright, bright points, but right now they're mostly examples. We don't have really great areas that are holistically dealing with flood risk um, uh, uh, as we look in the big picture, especially as we talk a couple decades from now. So that's, that's, that's coastal flooding. So watch my lecture. Um, um, uh, uh, understand the differences, the similarities and the differences between um, regular or riverine flooding and uh, coastal flooding. Uh, do our readings. Uh, we, uh, did anybody have any problems with Scoop It last week? I think not. Okay, so, so, so my, my account expired and I, I 
needed a new credit card, so I added it in. So if you guys tried in the last week or so to do a scuba post, you might not have been able to. It should all be fixed now. So, so for this week, scuba post, everything should be fine. Um, so we have some readings to do. I have some videos for you guys to watch to look at um, to look at uh, uh, some flood viewers. So you can get a sense of the scale, the magnitude of all that kind of good stuff. And uh, and yeah, and have fun. Have, have fun uh, starting to dig into uh, coastal flooding. And with that, I'm going to say you guys have a have a, a great day. I'm going to kill our recording. <laughs>